In the last videos, we observed the context of the first debate and the post-First World War, in which the authors are not concerned with creating a theory of international relations. They are concerned with solving a concrete problem. They develop a reflection on the nature of power to recognize the shortcomings of responses that are being generated to deal with the political and humanitarian costs of the First World War. Within this scenario and the need to generate an answer to it, we had the first debate. The second debate is different. We all already had a process of globalization of the international order. Before, the order was very focused on the structural situation of Europe. With the colonization, it began to change the policy that was previously treated as a colonial process. These newly emancipated forces will create an organized world through the same form of political organization, a nation-state. We have the English school, which deals with the problem of thinking about the international system in terms of different points of view of the particularity of the rules that govern their dynamics. In this, it is necessary to understand what kind of norms and values organize the dynamics of a system in order to understand what are the current practices in that system. For that, it is necessary to use history and philosophy. So it was similar to the previous ones, but it seeks to build concepts that apply to different parts of the globe. On the other hand, we have a different school. In contrast to the English school, which starts from the point of view of how to understand the particularity of the norms that organize the dynamics of a system, we have a theory that seeks to look at international relations as something generalizable. How do I produce a theory that can explain any system? How to produce such a broad and scientific theory that allows me to develop hypotheses to explain the behavior of the Middle Ages as well as the Cold War? So we have a problematic issue. The first problem to be solved in order to have science is that political science already exists. In order to have a theory of international politics, it needs to differ differentiate itself from the theory of political science. It is not a political theory applied to states. It must be a theory separate from the others. Here we have the concept of structuralism. It is a way of producing knowledge that is gaining ground in some social sciences and that is part of the debate called the debate between agent and structure. Here we have the following question. To what extent does the author's behavior explain how the system works? Or does the logic of the system explain the choices that are available to the actors? Is it the system that explains how actors work, or are the actors explaining how the system works? For structuralism, it is the structure of the system, not just of the international system, but of any system, that explains why actors work the way they work, and not the other way around. So, for example, in Marxist theories from the 60s, capitalism is a structure. This means that the behavior of agents, the dilemmas and dynamics present, are explained by the constraints that the structure imposes on you. In a capitalist world, the very idea of thinking about the world we are in has to do with the dynamics of capitalism, where we have a class consciousness. We are only aware of the real dilemmas reality is involved in once we understand the class to which we belong. We don't choose to belong to the class. It's something given by the mechanism of the system. It's the way it works. These mechanisms that organize people's lives determine several dimensions of reality, social bounds, or rights, entertainment choices, and more. Structure determines a large part of the choices we make, regardless of our subjective freedom. We only have autonomy up to a point. These conditions are reality. To understand society, it is necessary to understand social structures. Social structures limit the choices that are at our disposal. The choices that are at our disposal are different from the choices available to someone else in another social class, for example. Structuralism is important because it gives the idea of how to produce knowledge. Knowledge is made when we understand the cogs in the system. His objective is to show what kind of constraint the gears of the system impose on the units that operate in that system. The purpose is not to describe the units that work in the system, but to describe the gears. For example, the theory of gravity. If we describe all objects that are subject to the law of gravity, we would not have a law of gravity. The important thing is to understand the properties of the law and how they apply to the different conditions of this reality. This concept is fundamental to international politics. In order to have a theory of international politics, we must have the principle that separates the international as a domain and everything that political science studies. The first fundamental concept in structuring your theory is the organization 
organizing principle. This is where we separate what is national and what is international. For him, the organizing principle of the international system is anarchy. So why is international relations different from political science? Because international relations are governed by the constraints provided by anarchy. And political science studies power within hierarchical spaces. The dynamics of occupation of political science are hierarchical, in which the state distributes and regulates power, serving as the ultimate instance of conflict resolution. International relations are different because the international takes place in a space where this regulator does not exist. When we study the problem of power, we can only be between two types of space, or we are in a space where we have an organizing principle of hierarchy capable of regulating conflicts between the different actors involved, or we are operating in a space where this regulator does not exist. That is why a theory of politics and a theory of international politics are needed. The objective of knowledge within this domain for Waltz is to understand how the structure that characterizes that domain imposes constraints on the units of that environment. Once we have anarchy, what are the implications for the units? How does anarchy work? Within the state, we have different organizations that struggle for power, whether it is within the state bureaucracy itself or within actors that are external to the state. These organizations struggle for power within a state that is hierarchical, in which there may be a division of labor between these units. For example, the Minister of Economy deals with economy. The Minister of Agriculture deals with agriculture. This can happen because they are within a space regulated by another instance that resolves the disputes. The fact is that we are facing a space regulated by the authority of the executive. Internationally, this doesn't work because we don't have an ultimate instance that arbitrates the difference between the parties. Therefore, if units are to survive, they must fulfill the necessary functions to have their autonomy. Thus, for Waltz, in the hierarchical system, we have differentiable units with the division of labor. In the anarchic system, we have indistinguishable units, which means we cannot outsource the survival of the political unit. We cannot fail to have an army and let the army of another country protect us. We can be allies, but at some point, that could change. So the demarcation of the domain depends on the organizing principle of the theory. In anarchy, we have the constraints of the units themselves. The constraint is the fact that they must be indistinguishable. They work alike because they serve the same functions. Within the state, we have differentiation, but not outside the state. Equality means, for example, that both Brazil and the US need to have their armed forces. When we understand what is the organizing principle of the system, what is the structure of that system, and how the principle imposes a working logic for the units which are subject to that structure, we have the distribution of capacities as a result. The states are similar in the sense that they fulfill the same functions. They have bureaucracy, diplomacy, economy, and armies. All states generally fulfill these functions. It doesn't mean that they fulfill these roles equally, that they have the same strategy and capacity. We have states that are much more powerful than others. The question is, what happens to the system subject to this characterization? What happens to the units that are not regulated by any higher authority and we don't have someone to arbitrate the differences between these units? These units are placed in an environment where they need to relate, need to establish cooperative relationships or conflicts. Here, a process of aggregation of power is created. We have the dynamic that the units start out equal, but with time we have aggregation of power in our deregulated competitive system, anarchy. From the process of interaction, we will generate as a consequence the accumulation of power of a small set of units. The international system from older times or from the Cold War is likely to become a system in which few have power and the majority have none. Or we have a bipolar system with two great forces that divide power and spheres of influence, or a multipolar system with more than two actors that are responsible for the balance of the system. Why is bipolarity different from multipolarity? When we have two powers, it is very difficult to break the system. To reorganize the distribution of power, you will need something very significant significant, like a technological transformation, all the other countries that have less power need to join forces to rebalance this system. When we only have two powers, combining power to reorganize this system is very difficult. Let's compare this with the European multipolar system.
system with three great forces france germany and england every country knows that the other two can band together and go against it the number of combinations that can rearrange the system is much higher so why does the author differentiate bipolarity from multipolarity because multipolarity is everything else starting with three forces is something very different from the bipolar scenario by having only two forces the number of combinations to destabilize is less likely thus the bipolar system tends to be more stable therefore waltz differentiates bipolar from multipolar because of the factor of stability in a balanced system with three forces there are several combinations of forces that generate a coalition capable of taking me down with two forces it has no alternative coalition against the sofa power bipolarity is more stable because we don't have an alternative coalition when we are in the position of the superpower there is no combination of actors capable of swallowing its power projection capacity the other superpower may wage war against you and win but it's as much a risk to you as it is to the superpower in the cold war there was no direct confrontation between the powers because there was no alternative combination of forces that could dominate the superpower the superpower is in a position where it cannot be dominated as long as it is a superpower and we are in this two-sided position there is no combination of forces capable of dominating the superpower when we are in the area of multipolarity no force is far superior to the others but there is always some combination of power that could dominate others that's why the forces need to negotiate and have flexibility so we have to think about the difference between capacity the property of the unit of analysis and the distribution of capacity the property of the international system capacity is something related to what the state has the fact that he doesn't use the concept of power is because he needs to define power within the context in which it belongs and he doesn't want to answer the scene of any particular international system the author wants to write something general for waltz every system has units and each of them has specific capabilities to interact within the system waltz wants to produce knowledge that does not vary for each context the important point is that every system has a distribution of capabilities these distributions are observed in all international systems throughout the years but that poses a problem for his theory one of the reasons why it was important to have international relations as our science was to be of practical use so it is interesting to look at Walt's theory in light of its historical context. The book was written in 1989, in a very particular moment of the Cold War. It is a moment when all the variables that will start to destabilize the functioning of the Cold War begin to be inserted into the system. The 70s are marked by transformations, such as the oil crisis, the process of transnationalization of capital, and projection of power by multinational companies, for example. In that decade, the European Union gained a very very decisive degree of strength from a bureaucratic point of view of capabilities and of influencing the domestic policy of its countries mainly as a result of all the economic transformation undergone in the savages the end of the decade is the moment when they begin to think about the possibility of the decline of an american hegemony that emerged with the second world war decision makers were concerned with how we deal with the uncertainty produced by these contemporary transformations so what is this book's lesson what does it say about the international system the book believes that it makes no sense to give up bipolarity because of its stability he writes about the stability of bipolarity in exactly the context where bipolarity is beginning to crack the first fundamental issue is that he built a knowledge capable of marking the configurations of power but he did not bother to develop an understanding of a dynamic international system we don't have a theory of change in Walt's thinking based on this thought we have the idea that there are two configurations but it does not say under what circumstances a bipolarity can become a multipolarity or under what circumstances a multipolarity can become a bipolarity it does not say how change takes place it is not capable of dealing with the dynamic reality of the international system so we have a first fundamental element of transformation the other important element is the economic dynamics when realism took over as a hegemonic force economics did not play a prominent role in the late 70s the transnational element was of great importance when we look internationally it is relevant to understand the transnational aspect such as political movements and organizations all this is disregarded by waltz another element is the role of the state 
how to use Wald's theory to understand how states behave. Decision makers want an effective foreign policy, but Wald's is not proposing to do so. Hegemonic Stability Theory Within realism, we have the idea that it is necessary to have an intellectual structure that talks about the economy, about institutions, looks at the state, and thinks about change. Thus, Gilpin brings the idea of hegemonic cycles to try to understand the dynamics of the international system at that time. What happens when we have a power distribution that emerges victorious, as for example the US after the Second World War? The first concern of a force like the US is to provide stability to that system. In a highly competitive international system, even if you are the most powerful country, if you don't pay the price for some stability, the constant conflict produced by competitiveness will end up eroding your power. In this way, it is necessary to build a hegemonic order. Who raises the order is the hegemon. It is the one that emerges stronger in the distribution of power. It is he who makes a kind of initial sacrifice. It bears the short-term costs of hegemony, of stabilizing order and building up institutions to reap the long-term benefits of stability. We have to think about a power circle and the role of all the elements that critics said were not considered in Walt's thinking. Every time this power is projected, when we have a distribution of power that is born, such as the end of the Second World War, we have a choice on the part of the hegemonic force. The hegemonic force has to choose between short-term preponderance and long-term stability. If it doesn't build institutions to provide long-term stability, it runs the risk of attrition along the way. If it sets out to stick to preserve this strength, it will have to pay the price for it, creating institutions and organizing order. Who needs to bear the responsibility for the cost of preserving order is the hegemon. It's not the system. We have a process in which order is not born spontaneously, but as a product of the project of power raised by a hegemonic force. This reflects the vision and interest of this hegemonic Force. The institutions that are built benefit other actors, but in a way that reflects the working dynamics of the hegemonic force. Institutions are fundamental because they provide the stability and respond to the prevailing distribution of power in the system. They work because they reflect the power project and only work as long as the system's distribution of power is coherent with the power project erected by the hegemonic force and through these institutions. In this way, these institutions serve a purpose. As soon as the balance of forces changes, the usefulness of these institutions will be questioned. This whole process triggers a dynamic because institutions allow the system to have stability. But who pays the cost of prosperity are the forces that maintain the system. The important thing about this figure is to understand the cyclical character of this process. We have an order in which this dilemma of paying for costs emerges. But within this, other countries take advantage of the situation to grow at the expense of the as the process is dynamic, in the end we have a rebalancing of power. The forces that had no strength in the system take advantage of the order that the hegemon created and become relevant forces. Between the second and the third movement, we have a set of choices that relate to these forces that emerge in the system. The choice is, to what extent it is better for me to take advantage of this order and to what extent I feel confident to create my own order. Once a country becomes a relevant force in the system, continue to take a free ride is convenient to some extent. The rules are designed to benefit the interest of the hegemon. Thus, in the second phase, the country must make a choice between continuing to enjoy the benefits of order at the expense of the hegemon or to redesign the system with a new set of rules. Fourth phase is what happens from that moment on. When it wants to become a new hegemon, it can either fail or go to war with the hegemonic force. So we have a cycle. There is a change in the system. It goes from the establishment of hegemony to the growth of defiance to the challenge of the defiance and to a new moment marked by a new structure, whether it is marked by war or not. So with Morgenthau, we have the idea that power is not fixed. It depends on the scenario we are analyzing. High politics is fundamentally the realm of war and diplomacy. This is important because we have several dimensions in the social world and international politics must be seen as a separate sphere. The choices that mark international politics are decisions that have consequences for the survival of the political unit itself in the long run. These are the choices of high politics. When we make decisions in the sphere of war and diplomacy, we have choices where the integrity of the survival of the political unit we are part of is at stake. Even with other important choices with economic and cultural consequences, it's no use making a choice that allows you to prosper economically 
if one of the consequences is allowing your opponents to subjugate you militarily waltz waltz doesn't raise the question of power he replaces it with the notion of capability for him to understand the nature of the structure we do not need to talk about the particularities of the different dynamics of power waltz's idea of refraining from talking about power is no longer seen as acceptable therefore power can no longer consider the idea that economic transformations are not as crucial as military ones in the world of the sixties and seventies looking at economic transformations as if they were less relevant does not reflect reality in this way gilpin works with the idea of the combination of three elements political economic and military these three variables will combine in different scenarios and the strategy of one configuration is not suitable for another that's all thanks for watching